So, in the last module, uh, we discussed uh, the need for uh, multi-core uh, systems and we explained why uh, we have to go from single core system to uh, multi-core systems. And now, in this module, we are going to discuss uh, uh, one of the main issues associated with this multi-core systems, that is the cache coherency problem. And we first discuss what is a cache coherency problem and then uh, we will discuss how to deal with this cache coherency problem associated with this multi-core uh, process. So, in the multi-core systems, we have multiple cores and each core uh, will have uh, one or two levels of cache hierarchy as a private cache and then there will be a shared cache and this shared cache will be shared by all the cores uh, associated with that multi-core system. And if you see the overall design, we can clearly see here we have collection of cores and each core has a, a set of private caches and then there is a shared cache, there is a main memory and the I.O. system. In this particular example, we consider two levels of cache hierarchy, the level 1 cache which is private to each of the cores and there is a level 2 cache which is shared across all these cores. Now, we know that actually the cache memory is going to improve the overall performance by reducing the number of times uh, we are going to the memory. Because whenever um, we require the data and if the required data is going to be placed in the cache memory which is closer to the processor, as a result uh, we can uh, minimize the number of times going to the memory and that will improve the overall performance. And also most of the applications exhibit uh, the spatial and the temporal locality. So, as a result, uh, uh, we exploit this spatial and temporal locality available in the applications by using this cache memory that we already discussed as part of uh, our uh, uh, the memory hierarchy design and the previous modules. So, now given this multi-core system with the two level cache hierarchy where uh, first level of cache hierarchy is uh, private for all the cores and uh, second level cache hierarchy is uh, the shared by all the cores. Given this scenario, now let us say core 1 wants some data and it goes to this shared cache and uh, get this block of data and put it in its private cache. And uh, after that, uh, there may be a request from core 2 and it will go to shared cache and get the data and put it here. And simultaneously, there may be a request from core 4 and if a shared cache can support uh, multiple request processing simultaneously, so this request also can be serviced uh, along with servicing this request. And uh, after some time, core 3 may request some data which is uh, the same data whatever is requested by core 1 earlier. So, this block is placed in uh, this private cache as well as this private cache. So, effectively, once we have this uh, multi-core system, some data may be replicated in multiple locations in different caches. Once we have this cache memory in our system, we can reduce the overall access time because rather than going to the memory always, now we can service a request from our the cache hierarchy itself and that is going to reduce the access time and also it is going to reduce the bandwidth requirement at the memory. Because now most of the requests will be serviced by these caches, so as a result uh, the uh, memory bandwidth requirement at this level will be reduced. And also once we have this cache hierarchy with the private caches and the shared caches, so now what happens is multiple cores can perform load store operations simultaneously. So, for example, if this core can send a request and that request can be serviced by this cache, so it is not actually coming to the shared cache and it can service the request here itself. At the same time, if this core has some load or store request and the data is available here, then it can also perform simultaneously. So, in other words, once we have this multi-core uh, system where multiple cores can perform load and store operations on their local caches simultaneously. And also sometimes these requests can go to the shared cache, but again if the shared cache has support for multiple ports, then uh, this shared cache also can service multiple requests simultaneously as long as these requests are not conflicting with the same address and so on. So, so far so good. 
So having multiple levels of cache hierarchy, we minimize the number of times going to the memory that is going to improve the overall performance. Also, multiple cores can perform load and store operations simultaneously. That also results in uh, uh, increased performance. Everything is good, but having multiple private caches in multi-core system where we are running a multi-threaded application where multiple threads of this application are uh, executed on multiple cores and it may create cache coherence problem. As I mentioned earlier, because this data is requested by core 1 and core 3, so as a result this block is placed in the private cache of core 1 as well as the private cache of core 3 and now a thread executing on core 1 if it updates this data and after that the thread running on this core 3 if it requires the updated data this updation is not visible here as a result this thread is going to uh, read a stale copy and that is going to give a wrong computation and this is called as the cache coherency problem. So we have to deal with this cache coherency problem if you want to execute a multi-threaded application on our uh, multi-core system. So now we are going to see in the rest of this module how we are going to deal with this uh, cache coherency problem. And before that we actually illustrate this cache coherency problem with an example. A consider a three core system where each core has a private cache and we have a memory and this is connected uh, to uh, this common bus. So this common bus is connecting all the caches of this cores uh, with the memory and this memory has some data 5 in an address location Q. Now let us say core 1 issues a load request to read the data that is loaded at address U in the memory. So it sends a load request here because once it sends a load request data is not there in the private cache associated with this core. So this request is going to the memory and memory is supplying the data. So effectively this data 5 is placed in the cache associated with this processor P1 or core P1. After some time core 3 also requested the same data. So again 5 is brought into the cache of this core 3 by using the load request. So now core 3 wants to update uh, this value 5 to 7. It issues a write request or a store request to store 7 in the address location U. So it performs this. So as a result now we are going to have 7 here. After that if core 1 wants to read this data again and now what is the value this core is going to get? Whether it is going to get value 5 or value 7. If this write operation is not communicated to all the cores, then when it issues a load request to read the value from address location U, this load is a hit in the cache. So as a result, this cache is going to supply 5 as the value loaded in the address location U. So as a result, P1 is going to read the wrong data. Now, if core 2 wants to read the data from the address location U because core 2's cache is empty initially. So this load request is a miss in the cache. So this request will be sent to the memory and now the memory also has a value 5 in the address location U. So as a result it is going to supply value 5 to this core because if this write request is not reflected at the memory then still this address location U has a value 5 only. So as a result when a request from core 2 comes to the memory, this memory is going to supply only the stale data. So as a result this core 1 and core 2 are going to get wrong data and which is going to give a wrong computation at the end and this is what is called as the cache coherence problem. So in order to overcome this problem, we have to come up with the set of uh, uh, techniques uh, 
uh, called as protocols and we are going to discuss uh, uh, one protocol in our uh, design. But before that, uh, we know that our cache can be designed as a right through cache or a right back cache. So, in the right through cache, whatever we update in one level of cache, we have to update that in the next level also. That is what is called as a write through. When we are writing something to a cache location, then we have to update that in the lower level caches also. Whereas, in the case of write back, we can accumulate all writes in the, the first level of cache and only when we are evicting a block from the first level cache and if the block is dirty and if the dirty block is going to be evicted, then we are going to write it to the next level. That will be the case only when we consider the write back cache. In other words, in the write through cache, our writes to the first level cache will be reflected in the second level cache also. But whereas in the write back cache, the writes to the first level cache will be reflected only when the block is evicted from the first level cache. So, that this will be written to the next level cache. So, even when we consider write through or write back in any of these cases also, we still have this cache coherence problem. So, for example, we consider write through cache. So, when we consider write through cache, so all these caches are write through caches. So, whatever write we perform to any of these caches, that write will be reflected in the next level that is the memory. So, that means when P3 is writing value 7 to this address location u in this cache, this write also will be updated in the memory. So, effectively now this u is going to have the value 7 after we perform this write operation because this is a write through. So, whatever you write here, it will be written to the next level that is the memory. Now, what happens when core 1 wants to read the value from the address location u? Because this write through is not actually sending this data back to this cache and once we are not sending this data to this, so the previous data will be there as it is. So, as a result when core 1 wants to read the value from address location u, it is already having value 5, so it is going to supply value 5. So, as a result still we have the cache coherency problem even when we consider write through type of caches. Now, consider a write back cache. When we are considering a write back cache, so automatically this write will not be reflected in the memory and because of that when core 2 wants to read the data from address location u, it will send the request to the memory and the memory is going to supply the stale value. So, that means core 2 is going to get a stale data when we consider write back caches here and core 1 is going to get the stale data when we consider the write through cache. That means irrespective of whether you consider write through cache or write back cache, the cache coherency problem is there. So, in order to deal with the cache coherency problems, we have to uh, come up with set of protocols, those are called as a cache coherency protocols. In order to have a coherent memory system, we have to preserve the program order in our uh, system. When I say preserving the programming order, for example, we have n core system where we have n cores in our multi core system and we are dealing with the ith core. And uh, this ith core is issuing a write request, write a value n to an address location x. And after some time, the same core is issuing a load request. So, load from the address location x. Now, this load request has to return the value n because between the store request and the load request, there are no other writes happen to the address location x. In such scenario, this load request is going to supply the value written by this write request or a store request. So, that means when we have a system which is executing a set of instructions, then we have to maintain the program order especially when we are dealing with loads and stores. Only when we maintain this program order, then we can clearly say that 
this load request is going to supply the value written by this store request provided there are no other intermediate uh, store requests to that address location x. Second, writes are visible. So, this is again when we have an n core uh, system, there is a write request from core j writing a value n to an address location x and after that core i wants to read the value from this address location x. So, effectively this core i wants to read from some location which is previously written by core j with a store request and also we assume that there are no other writes happen to this x whether from the same processor or from different process. No other request happened in such scenario. So, this load request has to return the value n. If it is so, then we can say that writes are visible because this write is happening in core j, but this write is visible to core i. If it is visible, then only this core i is going to uh, return the same value whatever is written by this core j that is called as writes are visible. The third one is writes are serialized. So, here we can see core i is writing value n to address location x and after some time core j is also writing some other value that is m to the same address location x. If these two write operations are happening, then if both processors or both cores p i and p j, if they see these writes in the same order, then we can say that these writes are serialized. If these two are seeing this order in a different way, then as a result the writes are not serialized and then the memory system is said to be non-coherent. So, in other words, we can say a memory system is coherent if and only if that memory system satisfies these three properties. One is individual cores will maintain the program order and uh, writes are visible across the course and writes are said to be serialized across the course. If these three properties are satisfied, then we can say our uh, memory system is coherent. And once the memory system is coherent, when we want to perform a load operation, then uh, uh, we will get the, the latest return value from that location. So, as a result, uh, our computation will be correct. So, so, once these three properties are satisfied, now we can clearly see here any read of a data item from any core will return the recently written value to that particular location. So, the goal of any cache coherence protocol is to maintain this coherency across the memory system. So, to enforce the coherence, we have to come up with the set of protocols and uh, so once we have a coherent cache, then uh, we get the correct data when we want to perform a load operation or a store operation. And the coherent caches provide the migration and the replication of shared data. When I say replication, the same data can be replicated in multiple private caches, but even when we maintain the replicated copies, when we update one copy of this replicated copies in one particular cache, because we have a support of cache coherency, so automatically the other copies will be invalidated or updated whenever we perform an update on one replicated copy. Also, these coherent caches are providing the migration. Migration indicates that let us say a block will be there in one cache associated with one core and uh, if the other core wants the data, then this whole block can be migrated from the previous cache to 
the cache associated with this requesting code. So we can move the entire block of data from one cache to another cache so that we still have only one copy of data and uh, this copy is now with the recently requested core. So we can move the data from one cache to the other cache or we can replicate the data in multiple private caches associated with the multiple cores of the system. And uh, once we have this migration and the replication, so now we can consider right invalidation based protocol to maintain the cache coherency. When I say write invalidation, whenever I want to write something to a replicated copy, I will invalidate all other replicated copies associated with the other caches in the system. So that we ensure that only one copy of data is available with the core that is actually going to perform this write operation. So in other words, the core which is going to perform the write operation is going to have an exclusive permission to use that particular block so that it can perform whatever the write it wants to write it to that location. The other type of uh, protocol will be write update. So in the write update based protocol whenever we are actually going to write to a block of data or a replicated block of data associated with a particular uh, a core, we are going to send this write request to all the other cores also so that their caches will see if they have the data or not. If they have the data, then they will update in that particular locations. So we have two types of protocols, one is write invalidation based, the other one is write update based. And also we have two types of caches, one is write through cache, the other one is write back cache. So once we have these two types of caches and two types of uh, uh, cache coherence protocols, our cache coherence protocol design space consists of four different types of cache coherency protocols. One is write back cache with the invalidation protocol or write back cache with update based protocol or write through cache with invalidation protocol or write through cache with update based protocol. So, we can come up with a cache coherency protocol which belongs to one of these four classes and depending on the type of cache we have, so one of these two will be fixed and once we have that then uh, we will see whether we are going to go for invalidation based protocol or update based protocol. So in the invalidation based protocol, we are actually sending just one invalidation signal so that all the other caches which are having the replicated copies, uh, they can invalidate the data. So all you need is, we will send the address of the block where we are going to perform the write operation and this address will be sent to all the, uh, the caches in our multi-core system and uh, the cache controller associated with each of these private caches will look at this address and search in their caches to see if there is a match or not. If any cache controller finds a match in the associated cache, then that uh, block will be invalidated when we are considering the invalidation based protocol. So as a result, it is simple uh, to send the invalidation signal and it is not going to take too many uh, interconnection wires or the bus. So the bus width of this invalidation based protocol will be simple all we require is the address of the block needs to be sent so that uh, uh, the replicated copies can be invalidated. But the disadvantage with this invalidation based protocol is when we invalidate the replicated copies in the other caches and if any of the corresponding cores request the data next time, then they find a miss in their caches. So they have to again go to the previously uh, updated uh, core and that core is going to supply the data and so on. So that means uh, this invalidation protocol may sometimes uh, increase the number of uh, the cache misses because this invalidation based protocol is going to invalidate the blocks and if these invalidated blocks are required by the corresponding cores then we are going to have uh, increased number of uh, the cache miss rate. But on the other hand if you are considering an update based protocol. For every write, we are actually 
writing this value to the other cores also even when the other cores are actually not requiring this block anymore. So that means when we are performing this update based protocol, so we have to send not only the address but also the data what, whatever we are going to write it through that uh, store operation. So we have to send both the things to all the cores in our system and the cache controller will take the address and uh, search for a match in the corresponding caches and if there is a match then this data will be placed in the appropriate location in the particular block. So as a result all the caches which have this replicated copies also will be updated based on this write operation. But if none of these cores requesting this data in the future then this write operation is unnecessarily wasting the overall power consumption. So as a result there is a trade off in the invalidation based protocol we are minimizing the wastage of this multiple write operations and associated energy but we are incurring more number of uh, the cache misses but whereas in the update based protocol we are unnecessarily increasing the amount of uh, energy consumption because of this unnecessary writes but our caches will be up to date so that if they request the data in the future then they will get hits. So now it is up to us to see whether we want to go for invalidation based protocol or update based protocol based on uh, our requirements. Whether if you are not concerned more about the energy and so on then we can even go for uh, uh, the update based protocol. But another problem with the update based protocol is this unnecessarily increases the bandwidth requirement because you are actually consuming the bus bandwidth for updating our uh, right request in across all the replicated copies and so on. So as long as we are not worried about the bandwidth, we are not worried about the energy then we can go for update based protocol. But uh, in reality the energy consumption is one of the critical uh, the things. So we have to minimize this unne unnecessary energy consumption. So uh, in order not to put pressure on the bandwidth as well as in order to minimize the energy consumption it is always better to go for invalidation based protocol. So again when we have the number of cores in our multi core system is uh, let us say 4 or 8. So as long as the number of cores is num reasonable number or as long as in our multi core system we have reasonable number of cores then we can consider a bus based system where all the cores are connected by a common bus and they use this common bus to communicate across this course. And when we consider this bus based system then our cache coherency protocol whatever we design are called as a snoop based cache coherency protocols where whenever we are performing a write operation or a read operation we send this request on the bus and all the cache controllers associated with all the caches will snoop this bus and take that request and search in their caches to see if there is a match or not and if there is a match then the corresponding cache controllers are going to take the appropriate action either by invalidating the copies or by updating their copies and so on. And the other type of design is uh, the directory based cache coherency protocol here when the number of cores in our multi core system is large in terms of let us say a 16 32 or 64 cores or even hundreds of cores then bus based connection is not a suitable mechanism for uh, multi core system then we have to go for uh, network on chip or interconnection network where multiple cores will be connected through a mesh type of topology or something and once we have that type of uh, design then we have to go for uh, a different type of uh, cache coherency protocol design that is called as directory based cache coherency protocol. But the underlying protocol mechanism is same but the way in which the protocol is uh, implemented is slightly different uh, when we consider snoop based protocol to the directory based protocol. In the directory based protocol we maintain the directories for each of these uh, the caches and uh, the shared cache is going to maintain the sharer's information and uh, this shared information is going to say which cache which private cache is actually having a copy of the requested block. We are going to maintain the sharer's 
information for each of the blocks in our shared cache and uh, this block in the shared cache can be replicated in multiple private caches associated with the multiple cores and using this directory we are going to know who are all sharing this block and whenever we want to perform any write operation or whatever then we know whom to send our invalidation signals and accordingly we will just invalidate the copies. And this directory based protocol can be implemented either by considering a centralized design or a distributed design. So, when I say centralized design, so we will have a single directory and we have a single monolithic uh, the shared cache. So, that whenever we are going to perform any operation, all the requests will come to this centralized directory and uh, they will get the responses from the centralized uh, directory. But the problem with the centralized uh, design is because everyone is coming to the centralized uh, directory. So, the centralized directory needs to have multiple uh, the ports and that is going to incur significant uh, area and the power overheads. So, in order to overcome that we can go for a distributed design where our cache is distributed across uh, multiple cores and this cache is a shared cache. So, effectively shared cache is distributed across multiple cores and each of this chunk of the shared distributed cache will have the corresponding directory and which maintains the direct uh, the sharer's information for all the blocks that belong to that uh, the chunk of uh, shared cache. So, that once we have this distributed uh, directory, so each distributed directory will have a single port and based on the address location we can send our request to the appropriate uh, the directory of the associated uh, uh, chunk of uh, the shared cache. So, as a result we can uh, eliminate the problems associated with the centralized design. In summary, we have uh, invalidation based protocols or update based protocols and based on the type of cache we can design invalidation based protocol for write through cache or for write back cache or similarly we can design an update based protocol for write back cache or write through cache and also when we have more number of cores then we have to go for a directory based protocol design or if our number of cores is 4 or 8 that is a reasonable number then we can go for a snoop based cache coherency protocol. So, in order to implement this cache coherency protocol in our design, so we have to associate a state information for each of the blocks that are present in our uh, the private cache. So, let us say this private cache has for example, 1024 blocks, then for each of the blocks we are going to have some n bit information in this separate table and this n bit information is actually going to specify uh, the state of the block. The state can be whether the block is invalid, whether the block is shared, whether the block is modified or whether the block is exclusive or something. Depending on the type of cache coherency protocol we design, so we are going to have different number of states. Let us say if you are considering a two state cache coherency protocol, then we are going to have two states associated with uh, uh, each cache block and if you are going to consider a five state cache coherency protocol for example, MOESI. So, then we have to have uh, one of the five states associated with each cache block uh, in our private cache. Though uh, for the simplicity uh, sake, I am representing here this state information separately but actually we can have this state information with uh, the metadata of the cache. So, the metadata consists of the tags, other valid bits and so on. Along with that we can also have uh, this uh, uh, cache coherence state information. So, here in this particular design we are actually considering for each location in the cache we are going to have an n bit information. So, our entire private cache is divided into let us say k blocks. So, each of these k blocks will have a n bit information and this n bit information is going to specify the state in which the block that is present in that particular location in the cache. Let us say if this is going to say that it is exclusive then the corresponding block that is stored in this location of this private cache 
is in the exclusive state and so on. So, now we are going to see one the cash coherency protocol with an example. So, here we consider uh, uh, write through caches and we implement uh, invalidation based protocol. And we know that in write through caches, uh, if we uh, write some data to a block, then uh, the data will be updated in the next level cache or the memory in the hierarchy. Uh, so, now uh, we will consider uh, the first transaction. So, here uh, the core 1 wants the data from uh, address location u. Uh, so, uh, it finds a miss in the cache. So, the core 1 sends a request to the next level that is the memory and the memory supplies the data. After some time, core 3 uh, sends a request for the same data. So, it finds a miss here and it goes to the memory and memory supplies the data here. And now, after that, let us say if core 3 wants to update the data that is stored in address location u. So, because this is an invalidation based protocol, whenever core 3 wants to update some data, then it has to send that a request on the bus uh, indicating that, so this core is going to update. So, as a result, uh, all other uh, cores, if they have the data, they have to invalidate that particular copy. So, once it sends an invalidation signal on the bus, this bus is connected to all the caches of this multi-core system and also it is connected to the memory. So, all the controllers whether that is a cache controller or the memory controller will snoop on the bus and uh, these cache controllers or the memory controller will get this request and they search in their caches or the memory to see whether there is a match for that particular uh, the address. And if there is a match, then these cache controllers are going to invalidate the corresponding blocks. So, here in core 2, the, there is no data related to this address location u. As a result, it is not going to do anything here. But in core 1, there is a match. So, automatically core 1 cache is going to invalidate the corresponding block. Similarly, the memory controller also finds a match for this uh, address location. So, it invalidates uh, the data. But now, because uh, the core 3 is updating the value and we are implementing a write through cache. So, whatever the value we update here, that will be reflected in the next level, uh, the cache or the memory in the hierarchy. So, as a result, as soon as core 3 writes value 7 to the address locations u, so automatically it will be updated in the address location u in the memory also. So, at the end of this third transaction, now, core 3 is having the value 7 in the address location u and similarly, memory is also having the value 7 in the address location u, but core 1 cache is now having an invalidated copy associated with this address location u. So, now after this, if core 1 wants to uh, read the data from address location u. So, in that case, because it finds a miss for this address location u because previously it was invalidated. So, now core 1 sends the request to the, uh, the next level uh, memory and the memory is going to supply the value 7 to 8. So, as a result now core 1 is getting the correct data. So, in other words, whatever the write we have performed here in uh, core 3 cache that is now actually reflected in core 1's cache. So, it is effectively we can say writes are visible. Now, after some time, if core 2 wants to request the data. Now, in this case, so core 2 finds a miss for this address location u because it has not uh, requested this data earlier. So, it sends the request on the bus and then the memory is going to supply the data for that particular thing and uh, as a result, uh, core 2 also gets the value 7 uh, in the address location u. And here in this particular design, we consider that it is the responsibility of the memory to supply the data as long as the data is not in a modified state in any of the caches. But we can also consider a different type of design where uh, rather than memory supplying the data, we can even instruct uh, one of the caches uh, to supply the data if those caches have the requested data. So, again, so it can be 
like cash to cash transfer or memory to cash transfer. So, but in this particular example, we consider uh, that the memory is going to supply the requested data for any uh, request from the processor as long as that requested data is not there in any of the caches in a modified state. So, with that I am uh, concluding this module. Thank you.